Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore all things cinema. And I'm honored to have back Anthony Uzerowski, who is the author of Jessica Lang, An Adventurer's Heart, and co-author of Ava Gardner, A Life in Movies. We discussed both of those books, and I'll leave the links in the description box uh, below if you want to check out my interviews with Anthony on those two great books of his. He has written numerous articles on cinema and the arts with his work appearing, appearing in The Guardian, Film International, Gay Times, Queer Tea, and other major public and other many publications. You can also see his head pop up in the occasional documentary where he shares his love for classic movies and stars. And today we are discuss discussing his new book, Friends of Dorothy, a celebration of LGBTQ icons. I absolutely love the artwork uh, by uh, Alejandro Mogolo Diaz. I hope I have that pronounced. <laughs> somewhat right anthony welcome back thanks again for joining me thanks robert thanks so much for having me again it's the third time this year which is incredible. yes <laughs> you're a to busy you. you're a busy guy two books in one year i know the the ava book was 2017 but That's right. uh, we were able to discuss that earlier but this uh i love this book i mean the artwork for what for for one thing the artwork is phenomenal which uh, i'll just show the back uh for for one thing but everything you write about all these different lgbtq icons i mean i i know i wrote you on instagram i mean i once i got as soon as i got to judy garland i already had tears in my eyes i mean oh. <laughs> i found it so so moving and i learned so much so well done this is this is uh this Thank is a treasure Thank it's a treasure you so much that's really nice to hear that yeah that's really sweet and the artwork yeah it's i love the artwork as well i was so lucky to have alejandro on board as the as the artist because yeah it really elevated the whole project for sure oh absolutely and when you reached out to him uh did he were uh, was a lot of the artwork had he done a lot of this already or did he do new ones for the book um, he had done many of them, but certainly not all of them. There were there were quite a few that he had to do from scratch because he hadn't done them. So I, I'm not sure exactly how many, but I would say it may be close to 50%. Really? He had to wow. Do. Yeah. So I was really, yeah, I, I wasn't sure at all whether he would have time to do it because obviously it's a big project and I know he's mm -hmm. really busy, but I was really lucky that he agreed to do it and... Yeah, we were sort of friends on on social media before, so he knew who I was, and and I really admired his work. So from the very beginning, when I kind of had the, the idea for this book, he was the only person I I considered for for the artwork. So I I was really lucky that he said yes because I didn't really have anyone else in mind. Well, that's you know because as soon as I looked at some of the images. I could have swore I've seen a lot of these on t-shirts uh, mm. <laughs> and yeah. I know you can order you and, and I, and I Googled him and yeah, he does sell um, some of these images you'll see here as, as shirts and, and things like that. So he's such a wonderful artist. Um, but talk, talk yeah. to me a little bit about what, what was the inspiration behind doing, doing the book? I think it was very much sort of a selfish project when I was kind of just thinking back about the little Anthony, the little me, and and thinking who were the people who inspired me when I was a kid and sort of saved me from my own childhood growing up as a sort of queer kid and not really knowing what the hell was going on, you know, and um, not having any role models really and not really having anyone to talk about what I felt and how I felt and sort of feeling isolated and and those were the people, many of the people in the book were actually the people who who helped me and made me feel less alone. So I think the book just was my attempt to to pay tribute to them and also in some way reach out to if there's anyone else like me out there who might feel the same way, you know, to, if they find the book, they might, you know, in some way feel comforted. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> What and I mean I know you you talk about this in length in the book, but what 
you know, for, for people who perhaps um, have a, have their own idea about what a LGBTQ icon is, what, what to you is, does that mean? Yeah, it's quite an elusive term. I mean, I know some people are surprised, oh, but not all the people in the book are, are queer themselves. So like, why right. would you include straight people, you know? And, mm -hmm. and for me, a, a, a gay icon or an LGBTQ icon is someone who, yeah, as I said, sort of inspires gay people. So they don't necessarily have to be gay themselves. Um, and it's very much, I think it's also historically very sort of, um, place sort of placed in that period of time which now i think is a bit different because we are living in a different time and there's a lot more visibly queer celebrities we see queer characters in movies and in, on tv and we have queer singers so it's kind of it's different now i i, I imagine it's different growing up now for kids but when, even when i was growing up and certainly the generations that came before me it was you know you really did feel invisible as a queer LGBTQ kid. I mean, you didn't even know that you were LGBTQ. I mean, I had no idea what that even meant. You know, all I knew is that I had those strange feelings and those strange impulses that were different from everyone else. And I had no one to really talk to about this. So a gay icon is someone who you would see on TV or, or, in, a, in, a, or at cin in a cinema or listen to a song and they would evoke something that that made you feel like Oh, that's, you know, a bit different than the status quo, a bit different than everyone else. So mm -hmm. it's kind of at odds with the heteronormative, you know, order. Um, so for anyone who would disturb that order and kind of made you feel less alone, that to me is a, is an, a queer icon. Um, I think I mentioned that at, at the beginning of the book in the introduction that whoever did that for whoever is reading the book is a queer icon so obviously this list is not complete it could you know it could include so many more people and also people that are not famous you know if it was your teacher or someone who inspired right. you when you were a kid and helped you they are your personal queer icon so it's a very broad very open term i think would you uh it's i i mean a lot of the people you write about in the book I mean, ge generally speaking, uh, among the LGBT community are are well known figures. You know, like uh, Marilyn Monroe and uh, Joan Crawford and Betty Davis. Uh, you know, you see drag performers uh, impersonate yeah. them and th and things like that. So, uh, are a lot of people on your list? Would you say are are known generally among the community? Uh, or, or are some people just your own or did you, or, or was it mainly your own personal choices that happen to be known in the community? It's kind of both, but I did, obviously I did try to look at the people who are generally acknowledged for being, you know, gay icons like Judy Garland or Betty Davis or, right. you know, most of the people in the book are kind of, you can't really argue with it. Um, right. It just so happens that many of them also inspired me, which is funny that when I was a kid, you know, I was naturally drawn to these people. I loved them without knowing that they were gay icons because I had no idea what a gay icon even meant. Right. I remember every time I saw like Cher or Barbara Streisand or Marilyn Monroe, you know, even as a five-year-old, I was like, wow, who is this? Like I was, you know, instantly just electrified to see them. So to me, that's a testimony what what a gay icon is. That without knowing, you're you're somehow drawn to these people. So, yeah, the list is personal, but at the same time, I think most of the people, if not all of the people in the book, are kind of universally acknowledged as queer icons. So, mm -hmm. it's a it's, and, it's a kind of combination of of the two factors. And I, I mean, I also love the title "Friends of Dorothy," and I didn't realize that that you you wrote about you write in the book that during World War II, um, gay men would would say that to each other. You know, we're we're friends of Dorothy. Now, when you are you talking about uh, when you say World War II, are you talking about soldiers who were in the war, or is that just around that time gay men in general started to use that phrase? I think the original story is that it was in the army, but obviously then it kind of spilled out 
into the general world. So, yeah, like with all those things, it's kind of a bit of an urban legend. So you don't, it's very, and especially with queer history, because for so long it was so underground and so, you know, undocu it went undocumented. So, so many of these stories are kind of just passed down and, and it's very hard to, to pin it down. So even with establishing who was a gay icon in the 1930s or 40s, it's, it's quite hard. Obviously, you're not going to find it in the press, you know, you're not going to find right. articles describing it. So it's very much kind of just this very this personal history of, of all the queer people who came before us and kind of what they, you can just piece it together from pieces of information. But it's it's quite, it's very hard. It's very sad also to, to think that, 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 that queer history is so sort of underground for so many centuries and then decades, mm -hmm. you know, more recently, it's, it's just, it's, un, it's when it went undocumented, all those stories are, yeah. You know, what's also really fascinating to me is that at least in the, in the book, all anyone who wasn't, is a, is an actor in the book are from the classic Hollywood period. And I couldn't help but wonder, uh, did you what why why you felt why why do you feel so many of them are from because a lot of the musicians are from more you know La Lana Del Rey more modern mm -hmm. choices but but all of the actors um are from that period and I I was curious what why did why you felt that that period seems to stand out more amongst LGBTQ icons that's interesting I hadn't actually really considered it i think i mean cinema itself was very different and i think had a very different place in people's lives back then that's both queer people and straight people i think people went to the cinema more often and it was the sort of the main source of entertainment so um and movie stars were very different than they are today i think so i think all of that combined and there were sort of larger than life characters you know and those the movie stars back then really were venerated and kind of um, there were cults sort of that built around them. And, and I think that's something we don't see today. And mm. I think that in some ways pop music replaced that maybe like from the seventies onwards um, sort of rock stars and pop stars became more, more iconic in that sense, I guess. I mean, we still have mm -hmm. some actors now who would, you would consider sort of like, popular like you know among the gay community but it's not not the same at all so i think that's probably the reason why i mean cinema and cult of stars has changed overall mm -hmm. so i think that's also part of it yeah it's it it always has really fascinated me because as you said earlier i mean obviously people in the lgbtq community still have these similar struggles about coming out um, but obviously we're in a much better place. So, you know, I, I, it's interesting to me because back then, if someone were to say, like an actor said, oh, you know, come out as gay, their career would be over. Whereas that, that yeah. wouldn't really be the case now, even though there are still some of those similar struggles and obstacles. Um, so that's why, you know, it's fascinating to me that at a time when actors couldn't come out, um but yet the the those from that period those are the but more of the icons uh as opposed to someone like let's say Kristen Stewart who you know is very mm -hmm. you know she's married to a woman she's open openly um part of the community so it's it's to me it's so it's there's there's an irony to that you you would think it would be more people that come out with it uh as opposed to looking in the in the past but yet some of those people who, like you said, are not necessarily, weren't that, you know, necessarily gay, like, you know, Joan Crawford or Betty Davis. Um, we don't even know how they felt about those communities, but yet they're, they're so distinctive uh, and they pop out and they're just, you know, they're just totally themselves and there's no one like them. So I could, I could certainly see why they've been imitated and they're so uh, distinctive yeah. and iconic but it's just there's something that to me you would or i'm like why don't i see more of that now why it is more of the musicians i mean there's i don't know maybe there just isn't an answer for it 
I just think culture has changed, you know, and right. and also people, especially queer people. I mean, I think there wasn't so much a community back then. I mean, people, gay people, didn't really congregate in the same way because they couldn't. You know, it was right, in many cases right. it, was, it was criminalized, and so it it was very often just a single queer kid or even a, a grown up. You know, just sitting in a dark cinema and just looking at the screen, like having no no idea that there was. Anyone ah, else yes. like that. Right. So it was very much just this personal relationship that they had with what was happening on screen. They didn't mm-hmm. really think about was Garbo or James Dean or like they didn't think, oh, are they gay in real life? I don't think there was something that was considered. It was right. very much really the personal relationship in the moment that was happening between the viewer and the and the film that they were seeing. So right. I think it was just a very different world. And then in the 60s, when you start seeing sort of more of a gay culture emerging and people start you know going out and there's uh, gay clubs and the gay liberation movement and then you start seeing the music emerging so then there's a shift in culture so i think that's why that changed as well yeah yeah it's so it's it it's something that you know because i endlessly think about you know in terms of how culture changes and what people look at as, you know, quote unquote progress. And it's like life is never necessarily, you know, an up linear in terms of progress being, you know, like think, you know, some things take a back seat and then they, they, it's like more of life is more, culture is more of a roller coaster. So it just fascinates me that that time is um, where you literally couldn't come out, but yet so many of those icons are from that era but i i that's that's a really interesting point because i think like you're saying because people couldn't congregate in communities as much uh like you said that began in the 60s they were looking at the screen and and those people like yeah some of them yes were maybe gay or bisexual but and weren't open with it but they were so distinctive like you said james dean brando you know, Catherine Hepburn, there's just no, to this day, there's just no one like them. They just were uniquely themselves. So that's what's, <laughs> that's what's so yeah. iconic about them. Right. So, yeah, it's really interesting to me. I think it's like the whole generational thing is really interesting because even now for me, I mean, I'm still fairly young, I think, <laughs> but you know, I see it, <laughs> kids that are like teens or even in their twenties and their, their approach to culture and even queer history is so different than it was for me and like mm. even with this book it's been so interesting people coming up to me and saying you know i i had no idea about like most of the people in the book and i'm like oh really? wow i mean that's interesting it's like it's there are a few people that are maybe lesser known but other than that i don't think there are very many so to me people that are obscure in any way i mean you have people that are huge icons of the 20th century and yet to the younger generation they're completely sort of they have no idea who they are so it's it's wow. interesting how how that really changes and so yeah if i ask someone who's 18 or 20 or even 25 what a gay icon is to you i don't know what what, what answer i would get probably very different than mm. what it means to me yeah that's that's yeah that's fascinating to me i do wonder someone who's you know like you said if they're uh part of the lgbtq community at 1920 I'm, i wonder who the actors are that they uh at least look to in terms of their own lgbtq icons if just if just if we look at actors uh i i, I mean i i suppose it's different for everybody but it's really interesting it's different yeah i don't know yeah I, we'd have to ask someone who's <laughs> younger yeah. than us i guess <laughs> yeah no Certainly, certainly. Um, you, I know that was was it difficult to narrow down your choices? Because I know at the back, you you know, you mentioned more people that, uh, you know, honorable mentions, you know, you know, Greta Garbo, Cary Grant, Vivian Lee. Um, was it difficult to narrow down who you wanted to focus on? It was, yeah. I mean, originally, the project was much larger. And then um, when I found a publisher, they kind of encouraged me to narrow it down and, and to make it like a smaller coffee table book. The original oh, idea see. was for like a, a bigger, more in-depth look, and there were many more icons in it, but um, it ended up being more of a coffee table book, and they wanted 40 
icons. So I had kind of a hard time trying to to narrow it down. But but I did. I think I guess I just looked at who were the key people in each kind of period, um, and I tried to cover different genres, if you like, you know, film, but also music, a bit of literature, right. a little bit of activism. Um, Mm-hmm. Obviously, as I say, the list is very, you know, in, it's always going to be incomplete by its very nature. So I'm sure anyone who picks it up is going to be like, oh, where is this person? Where is that person? Of so, course. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it couldn't be helped. So this right. is what we want. <laughs> Well, I, I, I only had, uh, I only, there was only one person where I thought I was, uh, I mean, again, like you said, you can't include everyone. Uh, but one person I, I wondered if you thought to consider was uh, uh, Anthony Perkins. Is he, um, I don't know, maybe mm. in the community is not someone as discussed. Was that someone you thought to include or just couldn't include? I didn't or maybe because you don't consider him an icon. I don't, really, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think he's yeah. like, I mean, I really like him and I value him yeah, a lot me too. As, a, as, a, as an actor. And actually, it's funny you should say it because I recently watched Psycho again after a long time. I haven't seen it for a long time. And then I watched it like a couple of weeks ago. And I thought he was brilliant and he's gorgeous. Mm, oh, as well. yeah. Like, if, you look, yes. if you look beyond the creepiness, he's like, he's a really beautiful. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he was. Actor. He was. But I don't believe that he's really ever been seen as a as a as a gay icon. Firstly, because he he didn't come out for such a long time. He never really came out. Right. Um, he always denied it until the end. And also because he's much more of a horror mm. icon than a gay icon. I don't think he was ever like a poster boy like Tub Hunter. So right. he wasn't really someone I thought about for this, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I was, I was trying, I was thinking about it myself, and yeah, I mean, he certainly was distinctive. But I thought, but he played very, a lot of very dark parts. You know, men who were on, uh, you know, on the brink of madness often, or were, yeah. um, which I would not, not to say that 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 couldn't have been included. Um, but I was, uh, I, 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 I could see why perhaps. Um, he's not someone that that perhaps would be um, not that you couldn't look up to him as an actor, perhaps. But I guess a lot of his parts were so dark, <laughs> and and he playing yeah. a lot of tortured souls. But I suppose that's a quality that people could relate to. Sure, but and yeah. I'm sure for some people, but as a sort of general rule, I've never come across like him being specifically kind of singled out yeah. as a gay icon in any any kind of thing that i looked at so it right. never i don't know it's kind of to me it's it's very natural because i've been interested in this for so long even before doing this book like so it's kind of like a an instinct and i kind of know from all the things i've read and seen right so when i was doing this putting together this list i kind of knew who to include you know it was much right. more a case of like stripping it down because of the limitations of the book I see. But I felt like I knew who would be, you know, mm-hmm. who generally is regarded as a gay icon in the community. But of course, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that, some, you know, some some gay men, I'm sure, were in love with Anthony Perkins when, when they saw right. him on screen. But it's just, right. as a rule, I don't think he's included in the, the major gay icons. That's all. I see. Right. I see. I see. Let's let's talk about some of the films, of course, that you, you mentioned. I mean, again, my this is what I not that this is necessarily a film book, but I get there's so many stars that of course movie stars. So naturally movies come up. And there there are so many I still want to check out that I hadn't haven't seen before. But what are what are some favorites? I don't uh, believe that, that Robert. You have seen everything, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you you'd be you know you'd be uh, you'd be surprised because there are some well known classics I still haven't seen. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, oh God, May, May, you know I have never seen anything with Mae West. I, I have, and oh. I was like, when you when you the chapter on her, uh, I was like, oh my God, I still have to see so many uh, of these films with with Mae West. So. <laughs> My watch list is 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 much bigger on Letterbox now. Uh, but what 
what are some favorites uh, of yours that you discuss? I know there are many, but off the top of your head, what stands out? Well, I just want to quickly make a point about Mae West because this is really funny because when I was beginning this book, I hadn't seen any Mae West movie ever. Oh, really? I, I knew that she was a big gay icon and she is. She To this day, she is a huge gay icon. But I had never really been that interested in her. I felt that she was a bit grotesque and over the top and I could never really understand what the attraction was right and just when I was actually in Los Angeles when I chatted to you about Jessica Lang so a few months ago I was staying right. with a friend of mine who's a writer and who had written extensively about Mae West and he knew her actually in real life so he made me watch like almost all of the key Mae West movies like every evening we would be like we'd be like should we watch another Mae West movie I'd be like okay okay so we watched it over the span of maybe two months that I was there. I watched like most of them and I really grew to appreciate her. I think she's an incredible performer and a really funny, brilliant comedian. You know, she's just fabulous. So I, I would recommend seeing some of them. I mean, they're great and they really aged so well. I mean, they're so mm. old. It's like 70, 80 years ago, but she... She's still funny, and she still delivers the those one liners in a way that you still like laugh out loud even now. So <laughs> I think she's great. So I, you should definitely check some Mae West films. Out. Oh, I will for sure. I will because I I I know that I, I again like I didn't realize that she did you know was was there's more than one film with Cary Grant right or is it with her and Cary Grant? Well, I. I think it's just the one that she actually... Oh, is it just the one? Claimed, okay. She claims that she discovered him because he right. was unknown. And, like, they asked her, who do you want for your leading man? And she, like, looks out of the window at Paramount and saw this good-looking guy just walking down the... <laughs> I didn't the know road. that. I didn't know that story. And she was like, I want him. If he, you know what she says? Something like, if he can talk, you know, I want him in my, in my next film. And that's how Cary Grant sort of became a star so that's the story that she liked to tell i didn't know that yeah i did i i believe they uh, what what's the film they did together because i believe they have it on the criterion channel now i think it's she done him wrong that's it yes yes i gotta watch that because i was like i i don't know that one um so so, so that's what she says to him you know come up and see me sometime you know that's the famous yes. line Yes, I knew the line, but I had no idea that was her. Cary Grant was in that. Um, so there you yeah. go. All of us fans have our cinephiles have our blind spots. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, sure. I'll, but other I'll than catch that, up with it. I would say, other than Mae West, I would say, oh God, I don't know. I mean, there's so many. All the Tennessee Williams adaptations mm. are the things that I really gravitated oh, yeah. towards. My when favorite, I was favorite writer. Yeah. yeah, same. And I was just, uh, I remember watching like Streetcar and Cat on the Hudson Roof and The Night of the Iguana and all those things when I was a teenager, like really young and really being completely transformed in my head. Like it really just shook my world. Um, and there is such a queer sensibility to them, which now I see, I didn't really realize it at the time, but there's definitely a very sort of, um, yeah, a very pronounced queer sensibility about those mm. films and those characters. And many of the female characters were actually his own kind of persona, just disguised in a female character. So like Blanche, for instance, is very autobiographical. And so it's really interesting. And, and I love those films. I mean, I'm sure many, most of your viewers probably know them, but if someone doesn't, I would say, gosh just go and really dive in because it's an amazing an amazing treasure mm -hmm. i you know uh yeah i agree and one uh, one one of the films i'd seen it before and i watched again that has uh, uh actually a number of people that you discuss in the book is uh suddenly suddenly last summer oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, and 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 this has not Tennessee Williams, who you write about, Elizabeth Taylor, Montgomery Cliff, Catherine Hepburn, uh, many of the icons you you talk about. And 
you know, you know, I was, you know, because from his the other adaptations of his plays into films, they 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 often would eliminate uh, the 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 ambiguous nature of whether, you know, like Brick and Cat and Hudson Roof, whether he was gay or not. Um, And they, they would often take just really soften that as much as they could. But one thing I found with this film was they didn't really code anything. I mean, it, they were very upfront with the fact that Catherine Hepburn's son uh, was, was a, was a gay man. I was surprised that, I mean, they don't outright say it, but it is so obvious. I was surprised that obvious, they, yeah. yeah, I was surprised that the censors <laughs> didn't do any, and I'm, I'm glad they didn't, uh, because it's a strong film. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a great film, but it's got a lot of great things in it. I just felt they didn't, I, th- I didn't feel Montgomery Cliff's character had enough to do in it. I felt he was often just reacting off of everything. Mm. I know they tried to sort of give it more of a, like a love story between him and Elizabeth Taylor. But um, I mean, for, I have never read the one act play, so maybe it works better as a, as a one act play. Um, what do you think of the film? I was curious what you think of this film. Oh, well, <laughs> again, when I first <laughs> saw it, I was, very young and i was very impressed by it and you know it it had a great effect on me now looking at it and i also read a lot of sort of criticism of it and also sort of just like queer criticism so i know that some people hate it and they think it's quite offensive almost because oh obviously the, the 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 queer character you never see his face so he's like this faceless tragic oh i see perverse character who obviously had to pay for all his sins and indiscretions by dying in the most gruesome way and right so in that sense but i still think it's it's a big step you know in terms of yes representation i mean as you say it's a it's a queer story it may not be a happy a happy one but it certainly tackles those issues and there's so much in it i mean there's so much to unpack and i think the relationship between sebastian and his mother is so yes fascinating yes yes i i agree and also um, Catherine hepburn just choose the scenery like she's incredible in that so good scary and and creepy and uh, yeah i think it's a great film i mean it's very campy but it's almost like a horror film i mean it's very Mm. it's very unsettling to watch it even now and actually i I introduced my boyfriend to it um, last year. And I think when he watched it, he was like, what the hell am I watching? This is like crazy <laughs> stuff. Like what is happening? Like they ate him up alive and like, yes. it's like what? <laughs> but <laughs> it's, a, I mean, just for the acting, I think it's worth watching. I mean, Elizabeth and oh, Kat yeah. and Hebron, the two of them together is, is quite a, quite a thing to watch. Well, Elizabeth Taylor is phenomenal in it. I mean, that monologue towards the end, where she yeah. where she discusses witnessing him being her cousin being, you know, murdered and eaten alive is 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 incredible. Uh, Spoiler absolutely. alert! Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It's it's from 1959, so we can spoil it. Um, it's it, it's 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 great, and of course, in Gore Vidal. Um, was he someone you wrote about? And I actually, I don't think he was. No, he's not in it. But yeah, it's interesting. He wrote the script for it. Yes, yes. And I mean, Tennessee Williams is is credited, but apparently he didn't have anything to do with the film. And I, I don't believe he cared for the film. I don't know if you if you knew much never, about that. No, he said it was terrible. I think right. <laughs> <laughs> but he never really. I don't know if. I might be wrong, but I feel like he never had that much to do with writing the scripts for the films. No, yeah, not this wrong. one, anyways. Yeah, no, he didn't care much. I mean, he is changed from what I. I remember I did read the play at the time because I was so impressed by the film that I went and like found the play and read it, and it's quite different. So, I think. Yeah, I gotta read the but play. But I remember there was there was a documentary in which 
Gore Vidal discusses and he said like he had to you know jump over hoops because obviously there were so many things that the censors would have objected to so he had to invent those weird scenarios and kind of make it so outlandish that they would let him you know go with it and right. so I think that's how he explained it but also I mean as you say it's 1959 by this time I think the censorship rules were really loosening a bit and it was yes, becoming yes. easier for those narratives to be pushed through so I think that's why that film appeared at that time I think even just a few years earlier it would have been impossible to have a story like that's that. true but, yeah yeah that's mm. true but I I uh, there, there's a there's a lot about it that I I really really like so I have to um I'll have to read the play because I've I've never read the play. I'm I'm curious what the what the play is like. Um, speaking of of Catherine Hepburn, a film that you mentioned that I had been meaning to see uh, is Sylvia Scarlet from uh, mm -hmm. 1939, which George Cooker directed, um, which also is Cary Grant is in it. And you know what fascinated me about this film was you know here she is she's pretending to be a, a boy. And then once she stops pretending and goes back to being a, a, a woman, when she falls in love with that guy. And what's so fascinating is that then she was finding she was more comfortable as a boy. Uh, a, a lot mm -hmm. of the things that, that she was saying. And I thought, you know, I mean, you know, Shakespeare always played with gender and, 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 th and, and you know, gender role playing and things like that. But I thought, wow, I mean, it's it's almost as if they they're strongly suggesting this is potentially a transgender character uh which I, I i couldn't help but wonder what what people thought uh back then or if that raised any i i mean i i don't think uh i mean correct me if i'm wrong but I, uh, people weren't as aware of transgender you know the no. people back then right so so i i wondered if that was something that was controversial or or I, what did you think of that i wondered if that's what they were dancing with there I mean, it's hard to say. I don't think that it would have gone as deeply as, as tackling transgender issues, because as you say, I think it wasn't even really an issue at the time. I mean, it wasn't something that was discussed. Right, um, right. But I think just the sort of ambiguity of it was uncomfortable for people. So the film mm -hmm. wasn't a success and it kind of contributed to Catherine Hepburn's career sort of going downhill at that particular time when she was you know the box office poison and all right. that so <laughs> right. that was during that time um but yeah it was interesting because in the 30s before the strict censorship really came into place there were quite a few of those films that really played with that idea of gender being kind of yes. fluid and especially you know marlena dietrich and garbo oh, but yeah. Catherine Hepburn was one of the only american actors who dared to tackle it because in some ways, the public was more accepting of European stars being a bit more ambiguous or a bit more mysterious. It was kind of part of their their mystique in a way. Whereas right. with American actors, they were so much they were expected to be more wholesome and more kind of very male female. It was supposed to be very distinct. And right. Catherine Hepburn was one of the ones who kind of played with that. And you know, she was famously wearing pants and. And she was a tomboy and she always talks about it. So even though she was very beautiful and it was easy for her to be a glamorous star, she never really felt comfortable with that. So I think that's why she's such a big queer icon still to this day, because she was one of the first ones to really play with that, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I've always, uh, I've always loved her. She's, she's fantastic. And again, that, that was, it was, that's the thing about those pre, I, I don't know if the, the code at this point, because I know by 35, the code was like heavily enforced, but I, uh, what we know is pre code. Mm. Uh, I don't know if this is necessarily a pre, well, this wouldn't be pre code. This would is, it? Cause pre no. Yeah, because this is just after that. Because that's what thirty four, maybe it was thirty four, that that became strongly enforced. Um, I can't remember I what year is. So is Sylvia Scarlet nineteen thirty five? I think. Or yeah. Wrong? Yes, it's yeah, thirty five. So, so I think it's just on the yeah thirty four, thirty four. It and yeah twenty ninth to thirty four. I always forget if it's thirty four or thirty five. So there was just after. 
Uh, it yeah. feels more pre-code. <laughs> I think it's but... just like one of the ones that kind of still, I think there were f still a few that were being pushed through it. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's certainly one of, it feels like, as you say, it feels like an earlier film, but yeah. Definitely. I love them. I love those those first films. And obviously Mae West became such a big part of, of this period as well, because she was a master of pushing this, those narratives through even past the censors and she was able to right. to always work in something that was objectionable but she made it so that they couldn't object to it so right that was, yeah that was her her thing you know right yeah that that's what's so great about so many of the uh you know like the artists uh like billy wilder for example like so many people who were able to work around the code but still be <laughs> still be incredibly daring and code a lot of things and uh, and things like that. But yeah, I was glad I, I finally caught that one. Uh, and just one, the other one I wanted to touch on, um, which also has a few, a couple of um, LGBT, LGBTQ icons is Rebel Without a Cause, um, mm. James Dean and Sal Mineo. And what's so, I've seen this film so many times and I, I never, thought of the relationship between James Dean and Salminio's characters as, as being one uh, as of lovers. But when I saw um, the celluloid closet, the, the documentary, I was like, how, yeah. how did I never actually, I was surprised. It just went, it must've always went over my head. And when I watched it again recently, I mean, it, I know that the writer never intended it to be that way because I, um, I suppose what what he was getting at was more that he looked at him like an old Sal Mineo looked at James character James Dean character as an older brother, if not if not a father. You know, they he even mm. there's that one scene where he says, "Oh, you could stay over and you'll make we'll make breakfast in the morning like with my dad." And James Dean's kind of like, "What are you nuts?" Like he says something like that. Um, and I was, but. So it can be interpreted that way, but really for me is like the minute he sees James Dean in and he's he looks in the mirror in his locker and then he turns around and it's it's like like it looks so much like he was checking him out. I mean, he didn't know. I mean, I could see once they once they became got to know him, I could see like an older brother thing. But to think that that was the first shot, the first way in which he looks at him. Uh I, I don't know if yeah. Nicholas Ray was doing something intentionally there. Maybe you know more about it than I do, but that to me is very, is fascinating. I could totally see why people would look at it that way. <laughs> yeah, and also you remember he has the, a picture of Alan Ladd in his locker. That's right. As like his that's little right. pinup. So that's, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting because there's so many of those films that people were, that were even making them were not aware that there were any gay undertones. I remember... Uh, I'm writing about Lauren Bacall now, and she was in a movie called The Young Man with the Horn with Kirk Douglas, and oh, she's yeah. playing a lesbian. And there's absolutely right. no doubt that she's a lesbian in the film. And yet, when she was interviewed like decades later, she was like, I had no idea that I was playing. So interesting, isn't it? Character. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it was such a different time, as we said, you know, people, even gay people were, you know, we, it was never discussed. It was not something that was ever analyzed. So it was so easy for people not to even think about it because it wasn't mm -hmm. an issue. So I think so many of those films, the reason why I think they're so iconic is because it's so easy for us to project onto them whatever we want to see. Um, and that it's not, it's never explicitly said. And that in a way that makes it kind of more universal because anyone can watch it and kind of see whatever they want to see. Yes, it's, it's, now, it's ambiguous. Yeah, it's different. I mean, you have films that are, you know, they tell gay stories and it's great, I think, but it's mm -hmm. not ambiguous anymore. So it's, you know, you can just call it a gay film or a gay love right. story. It's so much more easy to classify it. Whereas it, with the classics, it's it's different because it's just so much is left unsaid and left to your own yes. imagination. Actually, I was watching this little documentary about Garbo last night and they were saying, you know, the last scene of Queen Christina when she's like that, that famous close up where the director told her to just like be like a blank slate. So, you, so people watching the film could just 
project whatever they wanted onto her. And I think that was such a big part of classic Hollywood is that so much is left unsaid and left to people's imagination. Mm. So whether you're a queer audience member or straight or whoever you are, you can kind of find something for for yourself. So I think that's kind of part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's what, you know, that's what makes a lot of those films so interesting because they're, they're, because they're, they're, they're layered in that sense, because you can look at that James Dean and Salminio relationship in, in, a, in, in, you know, in, in, in not just one way. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a very, it's very com uh, complex. Um, but yeah, but it's, that's what's... a film I love. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think when I watched the film as a, as a young man <laughs> or a teenager, <laughs> I didn't think of it as a, as a gay relationship, even though I myself was gay and I probably was hungry to see that kind of relationship. I still didn't think that that's what I was looking at. I just responded to it anyway. Maybe it was kind of a subliminal thing that, mm. and with so many of these films, I didn't see them as kind of, you know, I watched Celluloid Closet as well many times and many years later. And, you know, people talk about, oh, I saw this and I saw that glance and I was like, oh, this is... And I, I it wasn't like that for me. Right, right. I didn't right. watch, like, those films and, like, see a little glance and think, oh, those people are gay. I didn't... It, it wasn't about that for me. It was much more about just really enjoying it and just feeling so transported into to this world. And... and mm. I don't know. I ne I I guess I was very innocent or <laughs> whatever, but I de I never kind of saw that double meaning or never searched for it even. I think I didn't even hope that it would be possible. It was just for me like I don't know. <laughs> yes. No. I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean because <laughs> sometimes when I when I don't pick up on those kind of things, I say what what I'm like. What's wrong with me? How am I? <laughs> <laughs> How are these things going over my head? But as you said, they're it's it's they're not so simple, right? They're <laughs> no. they're uh, more co complex than maybe maybe it seems sometimes. Yeah, and just because you don't spot something that you're supposed to spot doesn't mean that right. you know it takes away its value. I, for me, it doesn't. You know, mm -hmm. um, even I remember I loved some like it hot as a kid. I loved. Oh. Gentlemen prefer blondes, and now I realize that those films are sort of seen as very queer, right? Oriented and having those very strong queer undertones. Of course, in some like it hot, it's quite obvious. But again, I didn't watch it with that in mind. You know, I just right. really right. enjoyed it, and I loved the characters. But I didn't think that there was a queer, mm. you know, narrative there. So right. it's it's interesting. Right. You just respond to it sort of naturally and whatever that means. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, I, I've, I had similar experiences for sure. Um, well, again, the book is called uh, Friends of Dorothy. It's out now. Um, you could, where's the best place for people to get it? Anthony is pretty, is it, uh, is available pretty much anywhere online? Amazon. It is, yeah. And yeah. I hear it's actually in bookshops, which is really nice because oh, now it's so, it's so difficult to get books into bookstores, but, I've friends have been telling me they've spotted it in Barnes and Noble. Oh, fantastic! And so that's good. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And again, just the artwork um, is is incredible. I mean, what I love about a book like this is that you can, I mean, you you can read books again and again, but you can go back just just to look at the images. I mean, speaking of May West, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> May. Uh, I just absolutely love all the artwork uh so you could share it with friends and family uh list again list taylor i mean he's so talented i mean unbelievable uh yes. what what he does so uh I'll give alejandro a shout out as well to uh stellar work here um where Absolutely. i know you yes i know that i i always ask this you're sharing people's social media handles i know you're not a huge social media <laughs> person, but uh, if people want to follow you, where's the best place for them to see what you're up to? I guess Instagram. Yeah, just Anthony Uzerowski. If you want to follow Fantastic. mostly my travels at the moment, because I've been traveling a lot recently. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, every yeah. time Anthony's here, he's in a different country on my <laughs> on my yeah, show. The 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 picture is getting blurrier and worse every time I'm on the show. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, depending on where you are. Actually, it's been okay. Uh, okay, that's uh, the, good. the image has been okay. Uh, and I know that you're working on uh, a couple of books. So you've got the Lauren Bacall book, and then yes. we have one about the making of the Misfits with Marilyn Monroe and uh, Clark Gable and Montgomery Clift, you know, two of the people that you discuss. Is there, uh, do you know roughly when uh, any of those are going to be out, or is that too soon to say? I don't. I mean, they still. I haven't even started on the Misfits one yet, and the Bacall one is so probably another year for Bacall, and maybe a couple okay. of years before the Misfits. So fantastic! Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to to those because I love that I love Bacall and I love that movie. So I'm looking oh, forward to that. That's great. Well, I I hope I can talk to you about both of them. Hopefully. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, uh, we'll we'll have you back um when you get those out but but i want to thank you again uh anthony for coming on uh and discussing your 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 new book so please uh let's do it again sometime soon absolutely thanks a lot robert Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is exclusive content that I create month in and month out. And as a subscriber, you are able to vote on polls and contribute to what I do on Patreon month in and month out. So head over to the link for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel by pressing the thanks link, which you will find directly below the video frame. Just click on the thanks link and you can leave a donation there if you choose to. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing. It is absolutely free to do so. By pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo, you will see it floating above my head in the top left corner. To your top left in just a second, just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes also click the like button and leave a comment below let me know what you think of this episode also you can also share the episode all of these things are what produce traction uh to my youtube channel so i appreciate you watching and thank you again and i will see you in the next episode